Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. For those who don't know, I've been in St. Louis for the past week at a uh, conference learning about telling our story. I love stories. Actually, I love reading books and watching movies. And as humans, we love telling stories, especially about our journeys. And there's different ways you can tell a story. And one way, a framework to tell a story is called the hero's journey. Now, the hero's journey has a few parts to it that makes up the story. The first, you know, the main character, a hero, makes sense. And then that hero is supposed to have some kind of destiny, a promise, something they're supposed to do. And typically, as we read the story, that hero struggles with their identity, who they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to overcome. And while they're going through this trouble, the hero normally has friends that surround them to support them, to give aid as they go through their journey. And lastly, and hopefully in your story, oh, there's the turning point. And this is very key. In the turning point of the journey for the hero, they realize who they are. Something happens that affects them that makes them stand up to go and fulfill the promise, the destiny that they were supposed to do. Now, this story, this way of telling a story, has been around for thousands of years. From Homer with the Iliad and the Odyssey to today's stories like Harry Potter, Hunger Games, and Divergent. But there's one hero's journey I really like to talk about and enjoy watching. Star Wars. If you're not a fan, hopefully I'll give you a reason to watch the films again. So Star Wars is a classic blueprint hero's journey. And we start off with the original episodes, which is confusing because that's four, five, and six. And through there we meet the hero, Luke Skywalker, a boy who finds out that he is the son of a Jedi, that he should become a Jedi. He kind of deals with this. He's a high schooler, so there's some identity issues with that. He gets some friends to support him through it. Han Solo, Princess Leia, R2-D2, everybody's favorite, and C-3PO. His turning point, he has to deal with some family issues on his journey. But in the end, he fulfills it. He becomes that Jedi. Now, I was born in 1985, so I didn't get the chance to enjoy the original releases. But when I was in high school, the prequels came out. So I got to experience waiting in line for hours to see a film that you could have just waited a day or two, but you got to be there to see it first. So you got episodes one, two, and three, and we got to see the journey of Obi-Wan Kenobi, somebody who was a Padawan, became a Jedi and Jedi Master. But as you watch the prequels, you realize that the entire Star Wars saga that we knew of at that time, one through six, was really the hero's journey of Anakin Skywalker, his rise, fall, and redemption. The Star Wars universe is filled with these heroes' journeys. Now, a really cool thing now is there's a new one. Hopefully you've seen it. If you haven't, I promise no spoilers other than the movie does have a plot. Through that film, we get to meet new characters, new journeys, and in the darkness of the film, we find out that there's an upper story. There's a story that connects all the films. We love heroes' journeys because each of us are on our own journey. Now, I want to take a moment right here to share my journey, if you guys don't mind. I know a lot of people have asked, how did I get to this spot? Well, it starts off, he's telling it, in 2008. I'm in the office of my senior pastor and I remember telling him, as I was trying to decide, do I try to find another job? Do I go into seminary? What do I do? I said this, I wish I had a Samuel moment. And what I mean by that, I wish I could be asleep and hear God say, Rob. And I would answer, yes, Lord, your servant's listening. If I couldn't have that, then I wish I could be like Luther, get trapped in a lightning storm. I wish there was just something to help me figure out where am I supposed to go in this crossroad of my journey. Now, why would, we, I have, why would I be having a discussion about becoming a pastor? Well, I was born, got that taken care of. When I was born, I was the first boy in three generations on my mom's side. 
It's always been daughters, daughter, daughters, Robbie. <laughs> but what's important behind that, uh, that, those generations, is that my great-great-grandfather and great-great-great-grandfather and great-uncles were pastors. If not, they were teachers in the Senate. So now, all of a sudden, here's the boy. You're going to be a pastor. So I grew up in all kinds of gun activities. But I remember talking to one of my Sunday school teachers a couple years ago. And this is so embarrassing. We were talking, and he said, Rob, I was so intimidated to have you in class. He had me in class when I was like in fifth and sixth grade. So think about that, 11, 12-year-old. I was intimidated because I know you would ask questions that I had no answer for. And typically, if I had an answer, you had a better one. I didn't know how to handle you. I am still embarrassed to think about that because then proved that I was a know-it-all. I know it all. And unfortunately, things haven't changed that much. <laughs> but again, I was told I was going to be a pastor. So I went to high school, was taught, learned to be a leader in the church until I had a car ride in the van with my dad. The van, it comes up again. And he made a point to me. He goes, son, I know you want to be a pastor, but you aren't like any of them. Now, what my father means by that is if you take the stereotypical pastor, when you think of a pastor in your mind, my father looked at me and said, yeah, they ain't going to cut it. The way I talk, the way I act, the way I think, didn't meet that model. I think my dad's actually right, though. But because of that, though, that changed directions for me. When I'm going to school, going to begin a business degree, I actually stepped away from the church, didn't go to church at all except for Christmas and Easter, did not get involved at all on campus. But then I came back after graduation, started getting involved, teaching confirmation, leading adult young ministry. And people kept on asking this question again. Rob, why don't you become a pastor? Again and again and again. So finally I said, that's it. I'll go visit the seminary. Well, it's a July evening. We left. This is July 2012. You guys probably remember that year because the entire country was in a drought. Illinois was full of disaster zones, the farmland. And we're driving down, and I pulled my back out that evening because we were loading this trailer to take to my sister. My dad had to carry me into the van. I can feel every bump. If you ever ran in a conversion van, you know about the shocks on those suckers. I can feel it. I'm in pain. And I remember praying or making a threat. I wasn't too sure. Saying, I don't know who's causing this, but I am making it to the seminary. And with that, the dashboard goes out. The, yeah, the car died. We are on the interstate an hour and a half away, pulling to the side, conversion van packed, and a full of a trailer packed. My dad's ticked, and we'll go with that, upset. Calls up, gets a tow truck to get the van. Well, my sister wants to make sure we get down there. So she grabs my car back home and drives to us. So my dad leaves with the van, and I'm stuck with my mother on the side of a road, and there's a storm coming. <laughs> so we get inside the trailer. It's pouring down. Uh, trucks are going by. It's not fun. Lightning's all over the place. That night, over 100 lightning strikes hit Chicago. This was without, like, no, it didn't rain at all in July, except that night. But I remember starting to pray and saying, Lord, I trust you. I know you'll get me down to the seminary, and I promise you, I will make no quick decisions. I will not get upset or angry. I will not say no. I'll simply let you work on my heart. And then I realized that I'm praying to God while trapped in a lightning storm. I hugged my mother and told her it was going to be all right. She goes, how do you know? Trust me. And here I am with all of you. But here's the thing. When it comes to journeys, even for myself, I struggle. I have doubts and fears in my heart right now and right here. Hopefully I'll remember the next word of my sermon. It's been a struggle for me on this journey. Yet God placed me here with all of you. Through your words of encouragement your letters, the muffins and bread that you've baked for me. You remind me on my journey where my eyes need to be on, where my heart needs to be on. It's not myself, what I'm doing, but the Lord. 
But here's the thing, you have a journey. We just celebrated a new year, which we kind of was enjoy for that. It's 2016. For some of you, this might have been a wonderful year in 2015, and you're hoping the good times keep rolling. But I'm guessing for a lot of you, your hope in 2016 will be a year of hope, of change. Whether it be with yourself, your job, or your family, we all have different things we're struggling with. We're going on. We're journeying through. Now, we might not have a wand like Harry or a lightsaber like Luke, but we're all going on this journey together. And that's where our reading, our gospel, comes with us today. Now, like all the gospels, or two of them, Jesus was born, and we celebrated that last week. Can you believe that? Christmas was just over a week ago. Yeah, it's crazy how time flies. And last week, Pastor Girdle talked about baby Jesus. And now, like the rest of the Gospels, it's time to talk about Jesus starting his adult ministry, being baptized by John. But that's not our text today. Luke takes, us a, takes a moment and shares this story about a 12-year-old Jesus. Let's walk on that journey. So it says, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This is done every year. There's four major festivals for the Jewish people. And this is making a point every year they do this. And I can assure you, every year, baby Jesus went with his family. Yet Luke says this, at 12 years, they brought him according to the custom. Why make that note? Well, for a lot of you, especially you have Jewish friends, you might have heard of a bar mitzvah. That's where a 13-year-old boy or a 12-year-old girl shows that they have a basic understanding of the faith. They go from being a child to an adult. Bar mitzvahs did not exist yet at a time of Jesus. In fact, Jesus is going through the customs that would create the bar mitzvah. At that time, a 12-year-old boy or girl would be taught the faith. And then that Passover, when you turn 12, is when you become an adult in a celebration. For the girls, that means being with mom and learning how to take care of a house. For the boys, there's two main options. If you really don't get the scriptures, then you follow your father and learn his trade. But if you show some intelligence, you show some understanding of what the word means, you would go on to further study. But also learn your father's trade. There was two things you had to do then. And Jesus is at that stage right now. Now we go on and read what sounds like the most biggest parenting blunder in history. They forgot Jesus. How could you do that? Well, here's the thing. When you travel to Jerusalem or from Jerusalem, you travel as a family, as a crowd. You don't go by yourself. So when they took off, they left with their relatives and friends. And there were so many of them. It took them a day just to realize that Jesus was not with them. So then they had to turn back. And when they turned back, they found him. They found Jesus. But they make this very interesting observation. It says that Jesus had questions and answers for the teachers and elders. Who are the teachers and elders? Those are the Pharisees. Those are the scribes, the lawyers. Certain individuals, 20 years later, come up again. But through his questions and answers, they were amazed. They couldn't believe a 12-year-old boy was saying stuff, thinking about stuff, beyond what they were thinking about. And when Mary finally came up to Jesus and kind of told him, hey, we've been worried about you, Jesus says this. And we sometimes overlook the significance of these last two words. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? My father. This is the first time in the Bible anybody has addressed God as my father. Yes, God acts like a father. God shows us how he is a father to all of us. But here, 12-year-old Jesus calls God my father. He knows who he is. And then he says, my father's house. Again, he's 12 years old. This is the time a boy would be learning the scriptures and also spending time with his father. Jesus is making a point here that I'm supposed to be right here, being with my father. 
Now, for a lot of kids, including myself, when you read this passage, this is typically the, see mom and dad? Even Jesus didn't always listen to his parents. You say that, but sometimes we forget that last little line right there. Jesus knew who his father was. Jesus knew who he was. Yet he went home with Mary and Joseph. He was obedient to them. He honored them still. So the question I ask as we're going through the journey of Jesus, this is what this whole next year through Luke, we're going through the journey of Jesus. Is this a hero story? Is this like the stories that are written in our books? Is the life of Jesus like the myths and legends of old? No. And here's why. This is the whole journey. This is what we're going through together. First off, Jesus, his birth was well, he was born in the heavens and in the earth. They celebrated. We talked about this last week. There were angels. The whole, the heavens and earth were so overjoyed that he was here. There was promises of his arrival, both in the Old Testament. But last week, we talked about Anna and Simeon. How lucky they were to have this boy here, but also the trouble that will overcome. But here's where our story today changes things. We're in the hero's journey. There's always an issue of identity. Who am I? What am I supposed to do? At 12 years old, Jesus knew he was the Son of God. He knew what he was here to come and do already. And when we read the rest of the Gospels this year, we read about a Jesus who goes out there and heals people. With authority, he rebukes those that are teaching falsely. We'll see him cast out demons, take control of creation, This isn't a story about some kid learning, oh, I'm Jesus, I'm the Christ, let's see what I can do. We watch somebody who is our God living and working with people. Another thing about the hero's journey is that of having friends around you to support you. Jesus calls disciples. And guess what? Most of these disciples complain, grumble, get really worried all the time, argue about money, Desert him. One in particular, which Pastor Scott a couple of weeks ago talked about, is the journey of Peter. Peter was hard-headed, quick to speak, extremely slow to listen, never really understood everything, and was always putting his foot in his mouth. Wow, those qualities sound like somebody I know. Peter was like the worst example you can think of as a leader of the group of disciples. And yet in the the rest of the New Testament, we see a leader of the church, someone who speaks of authority and Pentecost, repent, be baptized. When uh, sentenced to death, he tells people there's only one God that we look to, one name above all names. How do you go from that to Fisherman Peter? What happened? And what happened was, in Jesus' life, he reminds everybody of the turning point. What the Son of Man came to do, and repeats it over and over again. He came to die on the cross. Jesus was hung. He was suspended between heaven and earth. The God-man was between God and men. And there he took on death. There he took on corruption, sin, all the problems of our lives. He took it all right there. But here's the thing, when it comes to a hero's journey, when the hero dies, that's it. Story's over. But that's not the story we have with Jesus. For that Easter morning, he rose again. He continues to journey with his disciples, with his church. That means for all of you here, you're on your own journey. You have your struggles, you have your issues right now. You have things going on in your life that are blessings, but other things are making you, harming you, and things are going on. You have a God that's with you. You have a Lord that lives in journeys with you. You can bring your issues to them. You can bring your joys to him. You can pray with him, because you are not alone. I invite you, if you're looking about your journey in life, to come to Pastor Scott's Come Follow Me retreat. A chance to look at your own journey, your own life. Chance time to take time in prayer. 
Time to be singing. Time to be in the Word with others. Share what's going on and learn what it means to be a disciple. What it means to go on your journey with Jesus. Amen? Amen. There we go. Please pray with me.